Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Um, we just have about four minutes, then we'll get started for now. Um, good to see you guys. Hope you're having a great week. And just hang tight, and we'll be ready to roll in just a bit. Welcome everybody, always good to see you guys, whoever's arriving now. <clears throat> hey Sebastian, good morning, <clears throat> how's it going? Hey Jasmine, good morning. <clears throat> Just a couple minutes to go. Hey Zachary, Brandon, good to see everyone. How are you guys doing? <clears throat> Kylie, welcome back. Hey, Cordy. Hey there, how's it going? Good. All right, everyone, I'll be right with you guys. I'm just setting up the uh, Zoom link for my office hour meeting. I forgot to do that earlier today. So just a second. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, hi Oliver, Olga, Cordy, Angel, everyone else that's already here. Welcome back and it's good to see you guys. Give me one second, what I'm doing really fast is I'm just sending the Zoom link for the um, office hours. I know that not everyone or maybe no one will come, but if you do, you want the link obviously, so hold on, I'm sending that off. I meant to do that this morning, so let me just get it now while I can. Just a second.
Okay, cool. Hello there, Lane. Okay. So, um, cool, got it. To those here in the live stream, hi, everyone. Can you anyone confirm that um, you've received the uh, whatever Zoom link for the office hours that I have today? It would be in the Canvas notifications. Let me see if anyone here can confirm. And always good to be with you guys. Appreciate all of your messages and comments. So just let me know if, if you can give me that quick confirmation. So I just did send, that's what I'm saying is I just sent an announcement about uh, office hours today and I'm just double checking to make sure that they came through. Any of you guys see it? Nice. You got it? Okay, perfect. Thank you guys. So anyway, as you know, my office hours have to be uh, adjusted now. I sent a message yesterday letting you guys know that. So let me just say a few things to begin the meeting. As usual, I hope you guys are doing really good and having a solid week. Um, yesterday, my message just said two things. Number one, that I'm finished grading the midterms. So um, I'm going to be replying to all the student grade requests today, tomorrow, and through the weekend. So not to worry if you sent me a, an email request. I'll be certain to get back to you um, within a 48-hour window at the most. Yesterday, after I mailed off the announcement, I kind of had some errands to run, so I couldn't get back into my emails yesterday. And then, of course, today I've been commuting around and teaching. But once I get back and then after the office hours are done and I have lunch, I'll be you know, going through all the messages in my inbox um, one by one and sending detailed comments. So just hang in there if you've sent me a message. But please do. If you're looking for your grades, uh, I want to help you understand those grades. So just send me a message, and I'll be with you um, this weekend at, at the latest. Okay. Um, and in the same message, I noticed, I notified you that the office hours have to be adjusted from 11.12 to 11.30 to 12.30. That's just because I need a little moment to commute back home and then set up the Zoom. So anyways, um, I sent the link and it's there for anyone if they do want to use it. Okay, so let's kind of um, resume. If anyone has any questions, comments, anything at all about um, topics that we're discussing, assignments, or anything else under the sun, just let me know, and as usual, try to leave a comment behind at some point in the chat, just to keep that informal attendance track record going too. Okay, so today the plan is to finish off the work of Edmund Gettier and um, the famous Gettier cases in his paper called Is Justified True Belief Knowledge? So um, let me do a little review first to bring us back up to speed where we were, and then we'll push forward from there. Um, this week, we've started on the topic of epistemology in philosophy, and epistemology is the part of philosophy that is interested in questions concerning human knowledge. What is knowledge? How do we attain it? What are the criteria for having it? For example, what is the difference between knowing something and just guessing and getting it right? Um, well, that took us all the way back to the world of ancient Greece and some of the writings of uh, founding fathers of philosophy, Socrates and Plato. Um, I talked to you about the life story of Socrates, so I don't need to go over that too much anymore. But at the end of the day, the basic account of knowledge given was that knowledge is justified true belief. Justified true belief, something you think is true, that's believing it. But on top of that, it has to actually be correct. So you can't say you know and you have a wrong answer. Um, furthermore, just having the correct guess is not even enough to have knowledge. You have to have a true belief, but that's based on the evidence that supports the true belief. Then you have knowledge according to the ancient Greek doctrine anyway. Um, in Plato's dialogue, the Mino, this account is discussed by Socrates and this general named Mino. And um, I'll just briefly summarize that one last time. So in the discussion, Socrates asks Mino, suppose someone knew how to get to a city called Larissa because they've been there many times. Couldn't they use the knowledge to guide other people there and lead them there correctly? And Mino says, sure, of course. That's an obvious answer because anyone who knows how to get somewhere can clearly lead other people if they can get there themselves. Now he says after that, well, what if someone didn't know because they've never gone, but they do have a correct opinion about how to get there. And the difference is in this case, a correct opinion is just a true belief that's not based on evidence or justification. So a correct, a true belief with no justification. Wouldn't that work just as well? I told you guys to think about the example of using like a, a GPS navigation system like Google Maps or even just an accurate physical map. Suppose it's correct, so it has the right instructions. Won't that serve just as well as knowledge in getting someone to their destination? And, um, you know, at first Mino says yes, but then Socrates asks him, well, then why do people want knowledge more than just having lucky guesses and correct opinions? What's better about having knowledge? Mino says at first, well, the one who knows will always make it there, but the one who's just got a correct opinion, like a true map, but they've never done it themselves, they will only make it there at times. 
And um, Socrates kind of presses him on that. He says, well, what's the difference? If the map works, why isn't it just as good as knowledge? So finally he says, let me tell you why I think it's better to have the knowledge. And his answer, Socrates' answer, has to do with this myth of Daedalus statues. So my question to you guys as I'm finishing this little statement of review from Socrates' work and Plato's work, what was the whole point of these statues and the metaphor of ropes? So tell me if you can, what, first of all, let's start with this. What was the myth? According to the myth, um, there are these famous sculptures made by a man named Daedalus. And the reputation that they had was that they're so realistic that if you ever were lucky enough to come across one and you know possess one, then you should probably do what with these statues? Who can tell me this? I don't know, yeah? Tie them down with ropes. Yeah, do you guys understand that? The reference is to tie them down with ropes, correct? Now, why though? Why should we tie these things down with ropes? According to Socrates, what would be the basic reason that you should do this or what would be to your advantage in terms of that? Hmm? Let me see if someone in this chat can get it. What do you guys think? Why should we have the ropes again? What was the point of the ropes? Okay, good, Cordy, because ropes, um, well, you're saying this. Correct opinion with no justification is a statue that's not tied down. Yes, that's right. But we're, uh, That's very, very good, but we're going a little further ahead. Okay, now you say it, Cordy, good. It's worth more if the work is tied down because it will not escape the mind. Mm. Okay, you, you're saying a lot of good things, but it's almost like blurring the lines between the one side of the metaphor and the other. So sticking with just the statues and ropes for a minute, literally these statues should be tied with ropes because if not, they're so lifelike that people thought they would run away when you weren't looking. Correct, that's good, Kylie. So you wanna tie the statues with ropes because the ropes prevent them from leaving and escaping your property. Now the ropes serve as a metaphor, and this is what you're getting to, Cordy, right? The ropes are supposed to be symbolic of what element of knowledge? No, no, no. It's, your response is good, Cordy, for the most part. I'm just trying to keep a few points clear. But uh, here's my new question, if you could answer. What is um, the rope supposed to stand for? Symbolic of, what do you think? Do you know? Of? Justification. Of justification, yes. So that's right. You guys heard that? The ropes stand for and symbolize justification, meaning evidence and reasons. So what is the similarity? Well, with ropes, they keep the statues from leaving. With justification, it keeps true beliefs from escaping from your mind, okay? So you may have a correct opinion right now, but if you have no reason to believe that thing and you have no evidence to support it, then you'll either forget it or change your mind about it. So true beliefs don't stick around for very long unless they're based on evidence. But once they're based on evidence and reasons, justification, in other words, they stick with you and you get to keep the true belief forever. So it's not just here today, gone tomorrow. So that's the point of this metaphor of ropes and statues. The statues are great. It's like when you answer a question correct on a multiple choice quiz, but you guessed the correct answer, you're happy you got it right. It's good to get it right one way or the other. But wouldn't you rather be able to get that same information correct throughout your whole life instead of just on the one random occasion of the quiz because you didn't know the justification that gave you the correct answer? So Justification, he says, converts and upgrades a correct opinion to the status of knowledge. And um, it keeps it there. It keeps it from leaving your mind, the same way the ropes do with the statues. Now, I would say this to close that discussion um, as we move on and talk more specifically about Gettier today, that when we use in language, um, when we describe having justification, the kind of Language that we use even calls to mind the metaphor of these ropes the statue that Socrates is talking about. Because when you have a very well-justified belief, what kind of stuff do you say? My belief is really based on something. But basing something kind of refers to, again, the concept of physically basing something with ropes to the ground. Or when you say you have um, a very well-justified belief, sometimes you say, you know, my belief is grounded on a lot of facts. Like I have good grounds for my beliefs. So when you talk about grounding something, basing something, it almost sort of calls to mind the visual metaphor of attaching something to the ground by means of ropes. So anyway, there we go. Justification, truth, belief. These three criteria add up to knowledge and justification is key because it changes it from being just a mere true opinion, which is good but won't stay around for long, into knowledge, which is thus preserved and retained. Okay, so now we have to move way ahead in time to the work of Edmund Gettier, which we just got started on at the last point in the previous lecture. And so we'll try to finish his essay today. So um, just once again, basic information about the author and his life dates and the title of his paper.
We're talking now about the work of Edmund Gettier. <clears throat> and um, he was born in 1927, and he's still alive today. And um, his paper from 1963, considered a, a real important classic paper, is justified true belief knowledge? Question mark. And he's basically going to say no, not really. <clears throat> is justified true belief knowledge? Hmm. Well, that's the question that he asks in the title, and he's going to try and give us the answer that it's not the right analysis, or that there's something incomplete about the analysis. So, um, a couple of preliminaries start the paper off. And I think I discussed those with you guys last time. So um, I'll quickly run through those points again. Now that you've seen the title and everything, I can erase. <clears throat> so to start off his paper, there are two preliminary points that he wants to make clear. And he has to state these before he goes into his um, famous Gettier cases, his examples. These preliminaries are necessary to set up the examples. So one of them is this point, that it is possible to have a justified false belief. Okay, and uh, we discussed this concept and some examples last time. Like, say that someone was um, convicted at trial based on the evidence presented in court but it was a false and mistaken conviction. Later on, it was overturned due to um, DNA evidence or from some other person being uh, confessing to the crime and being discovered as the true perpetrator. Whatever, that's just one example. It can happen in other cases too. Someone thought that there was evidence that their partner was cheating, but it was misinterpreted and it was just that they were hanging out with their friends. So anyways, I don't know. Whatever the case is, there's certainly the possibility for misleading evidence, which leaves you with a justified but nonetheless false belief. A second preliminary point, and this one took a little bit longer to explain, but it's the closure principle, okay? And I'm just going to put it up here one more time, even though we briefly discussed it last time, because it's important to the discussion today. The closure principle is just the sort of axiom of logic, and what it says is that, um, hey there, how's it going? Yeah, just take a seat anywhere. Um, well, probably distance out is best, so, you know, maybe in one of the other rows, just because, you know, as if we have the space, we'll use it, you know? Okay, so <clears throat> to this, the closure principle, if you remember, it's the idea that if a subject S is justified in believing one proposition P, and then that entails another one, so I'll write it here. If S is justified in believing some proposition that we just labeled P for generality, and S, the subject, uh, sorry, no, not yet. And P entails Q, and S, the subject, deduces Q from P. Then in that case, S, the subject, is justified in believing that Q is also justified in believing Q. Okay, so that's the closure principle, and I'll just make sure to clearly explain it yet again. What it says is this. Suppose you're justified in believing one thing, but then you notice that that logically implies a second proposition. If you deduce the second proposition from the first one, then you're now justified in believing the second one as well, because the justification carries over through known implication. So I gave you guys, I don't know, different examples. I was born in the 80s, and that's just one fact. And I said, tell me something that that entails, right? So what is entailment again, everyone? Entailment is a relationship that holds between two statements or propositions. If A entails B, and these are two statements, then whenever A is true, that guarantees the truth of B. So like, for example, I'm your professor. Let's call that statement A. Do you think that that entails that I graduated high school? It does, because I can't be a professor and not have a high school degree because it's a minimum criteria for employment as a professor that you have a master's degree. So um, clearly the fact that I am your professor entails that I've received at least a high school education, you see? 
So in case I'm your professor and that's true, then you know the second thing also has to be true. So whatever evidence you have that I'm your professor, that's pretty good evidence because here we are in this class or on live stream, the evidence that you have that I am your professor is just as much evidence to justify the statement that I graduated high school. If someone asks you, what's your evidence that he graduated high school? You could be like, well, he's my professor in college. So I mean, you know, putting two and two together, I've deduced this. So when you deduce something from an already justified proposition, the second thing that you deduce is justified as well. That's all the closure principle says. Back when I was a grad student, you know, getting my PhD in philosophy, I had an advisor and he taught me about this stuff too that I'm teaching you. And he had an example about the closure principle. He had a lot of odd examples. Sometimes I thought they kind of hit, other times I thought they were weird, but maybe this one's something in the middle. I'll just pass it on to you just because I remember from him. Sven, Sven Berniker, he said to me, um, okay, so suppose you were petting a dog. I'm sure any of you guys could relate to having pet dogs. Either you have a dog or you have pet one or pretend you have if you never did, okay? So if you were petting a dog, I'm sure that you'd feel justified in the belief that you're petting a dog. You know, what would be the evidence? The visual evidence, the perceptual evidence, the tactile feel of the fur. So petting a dog, you'd be very well justified in believing as much. Suppose then you're like logical and you're like, okay, all dogs are mammals. That's a fact because they all give live birth and they're warm-blooded. So you're like... I'm petting a dog and that entails that I'm petting a mammal. So you could therefore be justified in believing that you're petting a mammal because you were already justified in believing that you're petting a dog and that second statement is entailed by the first. So whatever example you like to use, the closure principle simply says that when you have evidence to base one belief on and it's justified, then that same justification will carry through to a second belief that is an, an implied proposition from the first. Okay, so with that in place, we can go a little further into our discussion of Gettier's work. Another part of the setup of his paper is that he starts by providing a couple of different versions of the classical definition of knowledge that he's going to basically attack and criticize. As you guys know, that classical definition is the view that knowledge is justified true belief. And he says sometimes people will phrase the definition in slightly different verbiage or wording. But even when they do that, it's the same definition, just stated a little bit differently. So I don't want anyone to be confused in the beginning where he says, here's three different ways that you could put this definition. It's not three different definitions. It's the same one three different ways with three slightly different ways of stating it. So as an example here, on one of those three, the first, he says, the classical definition of knowledge states this. S, some subject, knows that P, P, the proposition that they have knowledge of, just in case, just in case these three conditions are met. Now, if you read the book, you'll see that there's these capital letters, IFF. That stands in logic for if and only if. And the English translation of if and only if is the phrase just in case. So I'm giving you that. S knows that P, just in case, these three criteria are all fulfilled. Number one, P is true, a truth condition, T. Number two, um, as the subject believes that P, that's the belief condition, B. And then number three, that as the subject is justified in believing that P, and that's the justification condition, J. So that's, you know, the canonical basic definition of knowledge that we've received from the Greeks. When a subject knows a proposition, that's just in case the proposition is true, they believe it, and they're justified in believing it. Now, he points out that sometimes people will state this just slightly differently. So over here, I guess, to the, to the left of it, let me write a different formulation. S knows that P, and so he also offers this as an alternative statement of the definition. S knows that P just in case, and we could put it this way. Number one. S accepts P. Number two, um, S has adequate evidence for P. And then three, simply P is true. Um, so, yeah, sorry for the like, glare that sometimes uh, affects the screen viewing, but if there's any glare here, 
what this says is S has adequate evidence for P. That second Arabic numeral right there. Okay, now question for anybody. Um, the first criteria in this definition statement where it says S accepts P, which of the three parts of knowledge do you think that that symbolizes? Justification, truth, or belief? Putting it that way, wording it slightly differently, accepts P is a synonym for saying what? Belief. Okay, good. So the first reformulated statement in this other wording of the definition, S accepts P, it's nothing different than the belief condition. What about the second? S has adequate evidence for P. If you had to judge, would you say that's, we've already taken the belief condition off the table. So which of the other two do you think S has adequate evidence for P could be? In a way it's easy because there's elimination when you look at the third, but what do you think it stands for? Justification. Yes. S has adequate evidence for P is a statement of the justification requirement. Very good, Cordy, as well. Adequate evidence, good enough evidence to be well supported. That's justification. Accepting something is, the, is another way of saying you believe it. And of course, the truth condition is stated the same way. So all that Gettier says at the beginning here is that sometimes in the literature and in discussion with people that think about it, you'll see them frame or present the three criteria in slightly different wording, but they all basically amount to the same thing. So do not think that he starts the paper by saying, look, there's three different different definitions of knowledge and who knows which one it is. No, he says, look, it's basically justified true belief classically. And sometimes people just modify the specific wording a little bit. Okay, so then with these preliminaries in place, we can now advance to the famous Gettier examples. So I'm gonna erase this stuff on the board here to create room for some little drawings and analysis of Gettier's famous cases. Now, um, Gettier in the paper that we have provides two different, what are called Gettier cases. And they've become known as Gettier cases because of the prominence and sort of fame they've achieved within the academy. Like these cases basically establish that the classical definition of knowledge is, is not quite right or something's incomplete about it. The first one, Gettier's case one is the most well-known and well-discussed. So that's what we'll focus on primarily. Um, and I'll give it a name so that it's even more memorable to you. So Gettier case one, we will call this Smith and Jones job hunt. Okay, so Smith and Jones job hunt, get to your case one. Um, and let me say this too before I just go a little further. We've dealt with hypothetical scenarios all semester in philosophy. That's just, that's part of what philosophy is. There's nothing I can do, you can do, or that anyone can ever do to change that. So whether it's good or bad, it is what it is, and we have to accept it. The cases are oftentimes unrealistic, and that's not a problem because we're just trying to focus on theoretical aspects of definitions and arguments. So never mind some of the unrealistic or fanciful nature of the example to be presented. But there are some realistic aspects of it that I'll try to emphasize too. And then I'll give you further alternative examples after this to, to sort of reinforce the logic and the point. Okay, so we have a couple characters in this hypothetical scenario. Smith and Jones are two of the characters and they're hunting for a job. So here's Smith, here's the other guy, Jones. And um, so what these two guys are doing is they're competing for an open position at a company and there's only one position to be filled. So they're like the finalists that have gone through all the other interviews and it's just down to these last two. Sometimes maybe you guys have gone through something like that. If not, it's a little nerve wracking, but you're happy to be in the finals anyway. So it's the last two guys, they have to be interviewed and one will be selected for this you know, nice position at a company. Now there's also the boss. He's the third character in the scenario. So here's the boss. <coughs> boss. I don't know. He's big, big head. I don't know why. It just makes it look different from the other two. So we can have a difference of the stick figures. So, okay. You see Smith Jones and the boss. Now the boss has interviewed both of them and he's finished with the interviews now and he's got to make his decision who to hire. And uh, here's something I need to tell you about Smith at this point. He's developed this belief. So I'm putting it as a thought bubble. It's not like he necessarily says it out loud but he's got the belief because he thinks this is true. So here's the, the belief. Uh, it says this, Jones, the other guy, his uh, competitor for the job, he believes, Smith does, that Jones will get the job and there's a second part to his beliefs that's conjunction and statement. 
Jones will get the job and and also Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. Okay, now I'll explain this. So we're going to label this here belief with a letter D just to have a reference. So this is, say, Proposition D, which Smith believes. And um, I'm going to tell you why he believes it, because it's not just that he's got a – it's random. He has very clear reasons for believing this Proposition D. So why does he believe it? Okay, first of all, after the interviews were done, and um, let's say like Jones leaves to go to the bathroom for a minute, and so it's just Smith in the lobby, and the boss is still there. And uh, he has a private moment then with, with Smith, the boss does. So he comes over and he says, hey, Smith, kind of keep it on the down low and don't say anything. But I just want to tell you right now while we're together that um, I've made my own decision about the hiring. And I'm actually going to hire Jones instead of you. I just feel like he's a more well-suited candidate. And I know it's a disappointment, but that's where I'm going to go with this. I'm going to hire Jones. But I don't want you to say anything yet. Just hang in there uh, until he comes back. And I want to make a more formal announcement. So this is just kind of between me and you. Just a heads up. I'm going to go with Jones. Smith is disappointed, but, you know, he hears what he said, so he's going to wait there patiently for the formal announcement. That's why he thinks Jones will get the job. So do we all understand that? Why does he think Jones will get the job? Because the boss tells him. What better evidence could you have, right? I mean, that's the boss who makes the decision. He has no reason to suspect that he's being dishonest or that he's lying or that he's, you know, not being telling the truth. So Smith believes Jones will get the job. Now, the second part, he also believes that Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. What about that? Okay. Well, he has a reason for believing this as well. It's a little bit awkward to say it, but uh, after Jones comes back, and now it's just Smith and Jones in the room, Smith looks over at Jones, and he's like, hey, Jones, I have a totally random question. Can you, uh, can you humor me for a minute and just tell me this? How many coins are in your pocket? You got coins in your pocket? And uh, Jones like, yeah, actually, I do. I don't know how many are in there, but I do. And Smith's like, well, how many? How many coins are in your pocket, Jones? He's like, I don't know. You want to count them? Smith's like, yes, I do. I will count them. So Smith counts the coins, not in his pocket, in Jones' pocket. Okay, so here's how it goes down. Let me see those. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one more. Okay, ten. Thank you. I'm sorry. I just, you know, I'm curious. I'm a curious person. I'm a little nosy. I just wanted to know how many coins you had, so I counted ten. Okay, so physically Smith counted the coins of Jones' pocket. So it's a very, very clear source of evidence that he's got 10 in there. So he puts those two things together, and he ends up with that belief. Is that supposed to say D? It says D, lowercase, with parentheses surrounding it. What? For, I thought it was, you were labeling it for belief. No, just D for a letter. Oh, okay, sorry. Doesn't matter that it doesn't matter that it signifies the, the word belief. Okay, no, no, no. Could have been A, X, W, anything. It's just random. That, that's the author's usage. I'm just copying him. He says it's D, so okay. So point taken, right? Smith is justified in believing this. He's got reason to believe that. He's got reason for two reasons. The boss told him the first thing, and he counted the coins the second part. So he's justified in believing D. Now, the closure principle is about to, about to kick in, everyone. Okay, so remember the closure principle? What did it say? It says if you're justified in believing one thing, but then you deduce something from it, then you're also justified in believing that second thing that you deduced. So take proposition D. And consider how it entails this very similar proposition E, which is just the same with slight different wording. Okay, what E says is this. The man who gets the job. Has 10 coins in his pocket. Okay, now all I want you to recognize here is that this statement, which says, can you read it? The man who gets the job has 10 coins in his pocket. That's proposition E right here. Look at how E is a logical implication of D. So if D is true, E has to be true because D just says the same thing pretty much. The only difference is that we re remove the reference to the name Jones, which is present in D, and we replace it with the generic statement, the man who gets the job, okay? But if Jones gets the job and he does have 10 coins in his pocket, then by logical consequence, the man who gets the job, namely Jones, has 10 coins in his pocket. So let's say that Smith is a fan of logic and the closure principle. And for no good reason or for whatever reason, he just deduces E off of D. Okay. Now I need you to put some of these moving parts together for me, guys. 
Based on the closure principle, we said Smith was justified in believing D, yeah? And we also say that E follows logically from D and he deduced it from that. So now based on the closure principle, what's the status of his belief in proposition E? He was originally justified in D. He has now deduced E from it. And therefore, according to this principle we discussed, we would say that the subject Smith is justified in believing what? Who can tell me what the result of this little back and forth of the closure principle in DE is? Yes, that's correct. Good, Angel. And also, Cordy, he is justified in believing E. Now, let's all be clear as to why. The reason he's justified in believing E is because it follows off of D, and he was already justified in believing D. In the same way, I told you that I was born in the 80s, and I was. And that's your evidence. The man told you himself. You heard it straight from me. So if you start deducing things, like Dr. Vulich was alive when the Berlin Wall fell, because if he was born in the 80s, it fell in 1990. You'd be justified in believing that second statement, right? And what would you say was your evidence? You'd say, well, because in class he told me he was born in the 80s, and I just deduced that since that's before the 1990s, he was alive at that time. So I'm justified in believing that second statement, and the evidence that you would provide was the evidence based around the first proposition that you had to leave. So if that makes good enough sense, guys, and thanks for your help, all of that backstory was just to get us to this basic point. Mr. Smith has arrived at this belief in E, and it is justified. He is justified in believing E because it follows from D, and I already told you how he had evidence for D, the counting and the boss's report that he would hire Jones. Now, at this stage of our example, there's a little plot twist, and every Gettier case has this kind of little twisty plot twist ending. The way that it always goes down is that in the end of the scenario, the relevant proposition turns out to be true, but for an unexpected reason. It turns out to be true, but for a reason that has nothing to do with the original evidence that the subject used to establish the belief. Okay, so here's how this little plot twist happens. Boss comes back into the waiting room where Smith and Jones are waiting for the official announcement, right? And he walks in there with his hand outstretched like to give a handshake, but he goes straight past Jones and he's walking in and approaching Smith. And Smith is surprised because, you know what he said before, I'm hiring Jones, not you. But when the boss comes over to Smith, He's got a big smile, and he says, hey, Smith, surprise, buddy. You know, I'm just a big joker. I love playing games with people. Sometimes I like to see how people will react to stuff. And so earlier I was telling you I would give it to Jones. I just kind of like looking to see how you would act and what you would think about that. But to be honest, now I'm being real with you. The whole time I made a decision about you, actually. You're the better candidate. And um, I, had, I had made up my mind way in advance, but I just wanted to trick you for a minute there. So surprise and congratulations, Smith. You've been hired. You can start tomorrow, whatever. So Smith gets the job. Contrary to what he had thought because he had based his earlier judgment on the boss's original statement. Now, and this is a total coincidence because Smith had no awareness at all of the contents of his own pocket. But it just turns out by sheer coincidence and unknown to Smith that not only did he get the job, but randomly he happens to have what, you think? He does happen to have 10 coins in his pocket. Now, he didn't know that before. He didn't count his own coins. He just happened to, you know, have some change with him. Now he discovers that he got 10 coins in the pocket. So I'm going to ask this question. Look at E. What does it say? It says the man who gets the job has 10 coins in his pocket. Now, tell me this. And that's also correct, Olga. Very good. Did Mr. Smith believe E? Yes, we established that. He believed it because he deduced it from D. Was he justified in believing E? Also, we've tried to show that he was because he based it on relevant evidence that gave him justification for D. Now, is E true? In the end of the day, as the story finalizes and plays out, did E turn out to be true? Yes, because who got the job? Smith. And he just so did happen to have 10 coins in his pocket. But here's the thing, guys. According to the criteria we've established, E is a belief, it is justified, and it is true. But what Gettier is trying to point out is that common sense intuition tells you that even though this is a justified true belief, due to the fact that it was formed on evidence that's completely unrelated to what made it true in the end, we would say it's a justified true belief, but it's just luck and chance that caused it to be true. So in the end, it's not actually a case of what? Knowledge. It's not knowledge. It's a justified true belief that is not knowledge. It's like this. It's like breaking the equation. It's like JTB, which is not identical or equivalent to K. 
And that violates the definition because, you know, these Greeks said that every single time you have a justified true belief, boom, that's knowledge right there. Now, Gettier is trying to show you not so fast. Sometimes you could have a belief which you formed through good evidence, so it's justified, and it turns out to be true, but the reason that it is true is completely detached from your evidence gathering processes. In that case, you're just sort of in a very lucky situation to have arrived at a true belief. But what most think, is that to really have knowledge, it can't just be random luck or chance that gives you the true belief. It has to be that it's done by the basis of the evidence that you uh, possessed and had and used to form the belief. So it's not knowledge, even though it is a JTB. And if that is so, it shows us that the definition of knowledge is not complete. It cries out for further criteria or supplementation. And that's the thing that we have not yet been able to... Uh, form ever since 1963. So living now in the post gettier era, it's a little weird because we're saying that knowledge is justified true belief plus something extra, which is just a question mark. And this extra criteria would have to be something that prevents the subject from getting the belief correct due to luck. But what kind of anti-luck criteria could possibly be specified? It's the subject matter of intense debate and controversy, and there's been no consensus view that has emerged to sort of reset and um, correct our overall definition of knowledge. So for thousands of years, we thought we had it, justified true belief. Then Mr. Gettier comes out of nowhere and he publishes these weird articles with these examples, which as strange as they are, are showing something that you could have a justified true belief, but it was only just luck that caused you to have that. And that's not really knowledge. Um, now I say this, Gettier's example in this case is quite weird because it involves some things that are not so realistic, like, um, like counting someone's coins in their own pocket or, um, or making a deduction from another statement for no apparent reason. But um, there are more realistic Gettier examples because this is the first one, but it spawned like a whole wave of literature where people just generated a bunch of uh, similar type of cases to study the implications and logic a little further. So let me give you some of those that I think are helpful to the understanding of any student diving into this material. And hopefully you can get a couple of different looks at it. They'll make it more um, kind of relatable. So here's one that's pretty realistic. Me, I, you know, I focus on epistemology, or I did anyway as a graduate student. So I, uh, whenever I get a real life kind of get your case happens to me or to anybody, I always remember it so I can use it as like a teachable thing in the class. So here's a real case. Um, so I was parking. I think it was actually here at Chapman even. I was parking at Chapman over across from like Beckman Hall, you know, and um, I drive a black... Uh, BMW car, it's like a 4 Series 2018. It's a nice car, but uh, there's a lot of cars that have that kind of similar make and model and um, silhouette. It's a Grand Coupe, so it could be mistaken for a coupe or like a slightly uh, smaller car. But anyway, um, the, the deal is that I parked it in one of the stalls, and I was in a rush to get to my class, uh, almost arriving a little late. So I didn't have time to like make a clear mental record. Of, Here's where I parked. I know where I'm going back. You guys have probably had that experience parking in a big structure and later on you're like, which parking place was I in or which aisle was I in or even which floor? I don't know. Well, in my case, I hastily left the parking area, taught my classes, and now I'm returning back later to come to my car, right? Because I got to drive home. When I get to the lot, my first thought is, damn, where's my car? I don't remember which aisle that I parked it in. So I walk around a little and I see one aisle and I, I clearly see with my eyes a black BMW car that looks a lot like mine. And so my thought is that's my car and it's parked in this aisle. So my belief, what I thought was true, was my car is in this aisle, okay? Now I walk up closer to this car that I had seen, and when I got close to it, what do you guys think I noticed? Oops, what? It's not my car, it's a similar make and model, another BMW black car, and so I was wrong about it being that, my, that being my car. But when I got up to it, I did notice that just a couple of cars down in the same aisle, there actually was what? You follow that little plot twist? Okay, so I came up to the one car, it wasn't mine, it looked like mine. But I then noticed that two cars over in the same aisle, a couple stalls over, there actually was what? Huh? Well, but which, which one? Yours. Mine, you follow me? Okay, right? So like I thought my car was in that aisle, but why? Because I saw a different car. So the visual evidence that I used for justification had nothing to do with my actual car because I didn't see it until later. But when I walked closer to the false decoy, I then noticed that, wait a minute, my car is in this aisle. So what was my initial belief? Who could tell me that? What proposition did I believe to start this example? 
Yeah, and it's, was that true? Yeah. yeah, it was true. Did I have evidence? Yes, I guess of a kind, because my evidence was the perception of the other car, which looked like mine. So that was justification for me. So I had to justify true belief, but hey, common sense. Do you think I knew my car was in that aisle based on the, the, the scenario I gave you? I didn't really know it. I had a belief which was true, but the evidence that I was utilizing was derived from a completely separate car. So I was just lucky, wasn't I, that there was this decoy to have established in me the belief that my car was in that aisle. So it's another case of a justified true belief due to luck. It's like Gettier's example where the person thought that the man who got 10 coins in his, uh, sorry, the man who gets the job has 10 coins in his pocket and it turned out to be true, but not because Jones got the job and because he has 10 coins. That was the evidence that Smith used, but the facts that made the proposition true have everything to do with him getting the job himself and him having 10 coins, which he was totally unaware of. Okay, another case. I got an infinite number of these. You're driving along down the road, and you look off to your right from the car, and what you see looks like a barn. So your thought right there is there's a barn in the field on the right. Okay. Now, suppose that if you were to go out and look at that barn closer, you realize that it's a very complex art installation. This is not a barn. It's a facade. It's a wall that's designed to deceive spectators of the road into thinking they're looking at a barn, but what they're really looking at is just a wall with no interior. And so it's not a barn. But behind the wall, which you cannot see from the road, concealed from the view of the drivers, there is a what? Yeah, right? Okay, so what was the belief in this example that there's a barn to the right? Is it true? It is true. And was it justified? Again, yes, but based on the visual appearance of the facade. So would you think that person knows there's a barn over there? Not really. They have a true belief based on evidence, but they don't know it because they wouldn't have gotten it right if, they, uh, if the real barn wouldn't have been there and there had just been the facade. You see, let me go on. You're taking drugs. You're not taking drugs. Someone's taking drugs and um, like hallucinatory type drugs, okay? They're tripping out. So while they're on these drugs, they see in front of them what they think is an elephant in the room. So their thought then is there is an elephant in this room. They believe it, but they're seeing things. And so they're not seeing a real elephant. But unknown to them, behind a partition in the room, is a what? A baby elephant sleeping. Yes, just say it. And that baby elephant in there makes it true that there is an elephant in the room. The person believed it. And they had visual hallucination evidence that made it seem true. But do you think that person knew there was an elephant in the room? Again, the answer should be common sense tells you no. It's a true belief. But if there hadn't been this secret hidden elephant, the hallucination would have still produced the appearance as such. And so their belief is not tied to the facts, even though the, it aligns with the facts in the end. So in all the different examples that I'm reporting to you guys, we see a common uh, phenomenon. A person forms a belief with evidence, which turns out to be true, but not for the reason they thought, right? Like in the elephant case that I mentioned just here, there is an elephant in the room, but not for the reason this person thinks, because they think it's because of the hallucination they're looking at, which is not the real reason. It's because of the unseen phenomenon in the other part. And, um, you know, Smith thinks that the man who gets the job has 10 coins in his pocket, but he doesn't think of that for the reason that it turns out being true, because he doesn't know he has 10 coins and he doesn't think that he'll get the job. But those are the actual reasons that cause it to become true. So what's the right definition of knowledge then? It's like justified true belief plus something that blocks luck from being the main reason that you got the belief correct. And uh, this anti-luck condition is very tricky to specify for philosophers and epistemologists. That's why I guess we haven't been able to put a fine point on it yet. My, I have my own view as to what the correct solution to the Gettier problem is. I kind of like the, um, the solution provided by a man named Robert Nozick. He's also featured in our textbook. I didn't assign him as an author, but his view is that you only have knowledge when not just you get it right in the actual world, but you would have gotten it right in a different possible scenario where the proposition's truth value had changed. So he's like, you don't just have to get it right in our case, but you have to also get it right in a modified version of reality if we just alter certain things. So like take the case of the barn facade. This person has a true belief, but only because they're lucky that there's a real barn behind the facade. If we imagine a world where there's no barn back there, then their belief would have been false. They would have thought there's a barn, but there actually isn't. Same with the elephant case. If there hadn't been the elephant hidden in the room, then the hallucination belief would have turned out false. So they get it right by luck in the actual world, but if we imagine a counterfactual scenario where we modify certain things, their belief is not counterfactually sensitive to changes in the truth value. So it's not like, had it been false, they would have noticed that. 
had it been false, they still would have believed it because they're believing it based on this decoy evidence or whatever. But it's actually still hard for people to uh, fully accept that solution either because it involves like discussion of what is a possible world, what kind of counterfactual scenarios are we supposed to consider in the setting the boundaries of how a person's judgment would change if we varied certain factors in cases like these. But anyway, guys, that's pretty much it for the lesson that I wanted to teach you today. The point of this meeting was to go over Gettier's uh, examples. There's a second Gettier case as well that we could talk about after this, but I think I'll leave it for now because I believe that um, it's a little more confusing and the uh, examples that I've been able to talk about today are a little more clear. So Gordy, Corti, rather, you say the extra condition in the equation is an anti-luck condition. Well, what I'm saying, Cordy, is that that would be the extra condition if anybody could fully articulate it in the correct way. And as of yet, as of today, we've not received a consensus winner in terms of this reformulated extra condition. In my judgment, though, I do think that Robert Nozick's um, truth tracking solution is the right criteria, where he says you have to get it right. But it also has to be such that if it were false, you would have noticed that and adjusted with the falsehood of the proposition. So he says you have to have like sensitivity to when it's true and false, not just getting it lucky that it's correct in the one case. Um, I don't know. Like I was, there's another example of this. I, I probably have to think about it over the weekend and come up with it on Monday. But it's something like suppose there's a door that um, has a doorbell, and the doorbell doesn't always work. But when it works, you know that someone's there. Um, so you're sensitive to when a person's present um, in some cases, but not always, because sometimes when they press it, it doesn't make a sound. So if it makes a sound, you know someone's there, but you're not always in a position to track when nobody is there, right? So you're like not fully sensitive to both cases. You're sensitive to cases in which the sound indicates someone's present, but there's no indicator of when nobody is uh, there at all, because silence is sometimes also a false indicator that someone is there since the doorbell is somewhat unreliable. Um, in the same sense, you as an epistemic agent, when you have knowledge, should be counterfactually sensitive to changes in the truth value of a proposition. So when it's true, you would believe it's true. And when it's false, you would believe that it's false. In all these Gettier examples, the person believes it when it's true, but if it were false, they wouldn't notice that. Um, but it's very hard to specify these counterfactually sensitive judgment conditions. So that's work for future epistemologists and people in the field today. Um, anyway, guys, that's what I wanted to say for today's meeting. On Monday, we'll resume and we will go into the work of Rene Descartes. Um, I had to push that into the Monday meeting to give full time and space for the lectures on Gettier and Plato this week. But we have two meetings set aside on Monday and Wednesday that were scheduled for the work of Einstein. So I think uh, we can compress Einstein into Wednesday and maybe a part of Friday. And we'll be pretty well on schedule uh, completely by the time the, the week ends next week. So do read the work of Rene Descartes, Meditation 1 and 2. We'll go over that on Monday in full detail. And I'll also be answering all emails uh, that I received about grade requests over the weekend too. So if you have sent me a, such an email, not to worry, I'll be in touch with you either today or tomorrow through the weekend at the latest. Um, and we just keep going from there. So any questions or anything else? If, if not, then I guess I'm good, but let me know in the chat before I close the stream. Don't want to do that until we at least get to say goodbye. So how's it going? Are we all good? Just wait. Okay, thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate your continued focus and all your attendance and participation. I know it's a long semester and sometimes the lessons get tedious, but hang in there with me. We don't have that much longer to go and it's best for you to try and focus even more in the end than the beginning when things are getting harder. So. Take care, have a great weekend, and uh, I'll be in touch. Thanks again. Okay. <clears throat>